Okay, so Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome is this accessory pathway that I'm talking about. And so it's the, it's kind of the same concept that I just talked about. So I'm gonna draw a heart here just to kind of give you an idea of what this looks like. Okay, so this is my heart here. My AV node is gonna be somewhere over here. So I'm just gonna put AV node there. And normally, like we said, up in the atria, right? This is technically, the AV node is technically gonna be in the right atrium as well. The SA node is gonna send a signal down to the AV node and the AV node is eventually gonna get the signal out to the ventricles, okay? So that's normally what happens. Now with Wolf-Parkinson White, what's happening is there might be an excitation pathway that can bypass the AV node. So over here, there might be some excitation pathway. And this is classically called the bundle of Kent. Okay, so that's this pre-excitation pathway. So in sinus rhythm, so if I had a sinus rhythm, right, so normal sinus rhythm, I would have an accessory pathway, like we just said, that would bypass the AV node, and it's gonna be anterograde. In other words, the signal is going down from the SA node through the bundle of Kent into the ventricles, bypassing the ventricles. So if I were to bypass the ventricles, what would happen on my EKG? So there's my P wave, that's from atrial depolarization, and then I have a slurring upstroke Right, and I know I'm not drawing straight lines. Let me do that again. So we have a P wave, slurring upstroke, QRS complex, T wave is gonna be my repolarization. The key is this delta wave, okay? That slurring upstroke, that's because of this pre-excitation pathway. It's almost like it's beating the um, signal coming from the AV node down to the ventricles. So in a sinus wolf parkinson white, right? So sinus rhythm, I'm gonna have a slurred upstroke of the QRS complex. That's what we're talking about. It's early and it's slurred because it's beating the AV node signal down. That's called the delta wave. That's what this is right here. That's the delta wave. Now, the QRS is gonna to tend to be wider because we're starting earlier off. We're getting to the ventricles earlier, and because we're not coming straight down the middle, right, this side of the ventricles might take a little bit longer to depolarize. So it's gonna have a wider QRS for that reason. Okay, so if you can picture the image, it kind of makes sense. And the PR interval is gonna be shortened. Why is the PR interval shortened? PR interval is gonna be, remember, that's gonna be this right here, right? This is gonna be my PR interval. Why is that shortened? That's shortened because this is gonna start earlier, like we just said. PR interval shorter because we're getting signal down quicker. QRS is longer, pretty much for the same reason, because that signal is getting down quicker, and now it's gotta to get to the other side. This pathway that we just said, in sinus rhythm, this is generally asymptomatic. A lot of times this will be in a younger patient, they'll do an EKG, and you might notice this slurring upstroke, and you might not even be looking for it, you might be looking for something else, okay? But in general, shortened PR interval, early upstroke, delta wave, and wide QRS. If you're ever looking at an EKG and you're like, what am I looking for? I don't see anything for this board question. Look for that slurring upstroke because it can be really subtle. And until you see a couple of them, you might not be comfortable really looking for it. That's in sinus. Now, where it gets tricky, we're gonna add a layer onto this to make it a little bit more complicated. So let's just say, instead of us having a sinus rhythm. Okay, so let's say this patient had Wolf Parkinson White. They had this accessory pathway, the bundle of Kent. They've had it for a long time. While they've had it, they've never known that they've had it. Okay, and let's just say that they also develop SVT at some point for whatever reason. What can potentially happen here is these patients can end up getting a reentrant circuit. So let me just show you what I mean. So this patient had, maybe they had you know, pre-excitation syndrome for some time. They generate a signal that goes down to the SA node, and let's say this signal uh, gets conducted through the AV node in this patient, for whatever reason, right? It goes through the AV node, but now what can happen is, once the signal gets down here to the ventricle, it can actually go retrograde back up. And then you can end up with this circuit right here. So in other words, we start at the SA node, right? The signal comes down through the AV node, and then we generate this circuit, where we have this constant kind of signal coming through here at really high speeds. That's essentially gonna cancel out some of the signal coming from the SA node. Okay, so this would be orthodromic atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, which is a type of SVT. Remember, this is one of the types, okay, from the last slide. So it's a reentrant circuit, anterograde through the AV node, retrograde through the bundle of Kent. That's exactly what's happening. Anterograde through the AV node, retrograde through the bundle of Kent. Okay, so in these situations, we would actually expect to have a narrow QRS complex, complex as opposed to a wide one. Part of the reason for that is because, again, we're sending the signal through the AV node. We normally would expect to have a more narrow QRS complex anyway. So the signal that's getting to the ventricles, it's gonna be narrow because it's coming through the AV node like we normally would expect. And the P wave should follow the QRS usually because, again, the signal was initiated from the SA node. So unless you're at really, really high heart rates, you still should have 
a kind of narrow complex. The thing is you're gonna have a tachycardia though. So SVT in general will tend to look more something like this. And you're just gonna assume that I'm drawing P waves here, but it kind of just looks something like this and assume these are regular RR intervals, but it's gonna be very fast, narrow complex. Okay, that's kind of what you're looking for. So you're not gonna see the delta wave. You're not gonna see slurring upstroke if a patient has SVT. Because again, the signal is starting here. It's not going this way. The signal is going retrograde through the bundle of Kent, right? And so you're going to get narrow complex because the signal is going to come from the AV node like we normally would expect. But it's going to be really high heart rates because you have this retrograde transport through the bundle of Kent. So that's AVRT. Now, when you have this happening and you get heart rates into the 160s and 170s, in those situations, you're generally going to have patients that are going to be symptomatic. They're going to have palpitations. Again, this is going to happen abruptly because a circuit is just going to form like that. The circuit it forms and we're going. And just like when you break this circuit, if I give an AV nodal blocking agent, right, if I put an AV nodal blocking agent right here and I block this AV node, now suddenly I can break this circuit, okay? So that's why it says here adenosine and calcium channel blockers are ideal for orthodromic AVRT, right? If I use adenosine, right, remember what adenosine does, increases potassium conductance at the AV node, decreases the L-type calcium channel, same for calcium channel blockers, that can block this AV node and essentially block this cycle, okay? Now, if a patient has antidromic AVRT, what's essentially happening is this whole cycle is going in reverse. So let me show you what I mean. So instead, the signal, again, it's coming down the bundle of Kent, like we initially saw, but it's reversing back up through the AV node to create a cycle, something like this. Okay, and then some of the signal is also gonna get to the ventricles. But the big thing is your whole reentrant cycle is going anterograde through the bundle of Kent, retrograde back up through the AV node. Okay, so that's the antidromic, again, because it's going anti from this normal physiologic way that this conduction would normally happen through the AV node. Now, we could definitely go into more detail on this, but I don't want to super overwhelm you. You know, but one thing just to think about, food for thought, why would you not want to give adenosine and calcium channel blockers to a patient that has antidromic AVRT? I mean, think about this, right? So if you gave a patient, let's say I gave a patient adenosine, right? If I gave a patient adenosine here and I blocked the AV node, well, you know, that's what we just said. We wanted to block the AV node, right? Well, if I block the AV node here, instead of my signal coming back up from the through the bundle of Kent, instead everything is going to go to the ventricles. And when I send all of these signals to the ventricles all at once and nothing's coming back up, what can you end up with? When you have a bunch of signals coming to the ventricles right through this bundle of Kent, you can end up with ventricular tachycardia, you can end up with ventricular fibrillation, right? Because you have an unrestricted amount of signals coming through. When we had orthodromic AVRT, we didn't have that problem because the signal was coming back up through the bundle of Kent. When that signal comes back up, it's not going to have that same effect on the ventricles. A lot of that will probably cancel out up here. But if you have an AV nodal blocking agent that's blocking all of these signals coming out of the ventricles from going back up, they're all going to be stuck shooting out to your ventricles and that can generate VTAC or VFib, which can be lethal, okay? So that's why you do not use adenosine and calcium channel blockers if uh, you're, you're thinking it's antidromic. In those situations, you use procainamide. Let's just say that you have a patient that has AFib, right? And I'm gonna take some of this away for a second. So if you have a patient that has atrial fibrillation, okay, which we talked about, if the patient has atrial fibrillation, they're gonna have a pretty significant atrial rate coming usually from the pulmonary vein ostea, right? This is gonna be left atrium. Okay, they're going to have a pretty significant rate, like let's just say 400 per minute, okay, coming from this atria and atrial fibrillation. And again, normally these signals are all going to bombard the AV node, but only some of the signals are going to get through because of the refractory period of the AV node. But again, if you give this patient a nodal blocking agent, you say, okay, let me give them a calcium channel blocker, let me give them digoxin, let me give them a beta blocker, right, and you shut this down, now, all of these signals, if there's an accessory pathway that happens to be here, all of these signals are going to now flood this accessory pathway, and then you give your patient ventricular tachycardia, or you give your patient VFib, because this pathway doesn't have the same refractory period that you have in your AV node. You want that refractory period to absorb, so to speak, some of those signals that are coming in because it's not gonna conduct them all. And again, unstable, it's electrical cardioversion, definitive, same thing, catheter ablation of the pathway. And again, AV nodal blocking agents and vagal maneuvers, you have to be very careful, you know, depending on if the patient has antidromic AVRT, if they also have atrial fibrillation, and the setting of an accessory pathway, you can end up with VTAC or VFib.